So. It would be nice. I, I would love to recap on circuits as well with you. Circuits. Yes. Okay. Look, guys, let's put it this way. Anelli told me that we've got only nine teaching days to go. I don't believe him. I think he's lying. But let's suppose he's true. We've got as much time as you prepare to give us. I am prepared to give you as much time as you need. So while you're writing exams, you write, it's two hours, what's two hours? We come afterwards, we teach some more. Yes, the main thing is, I want to get you to the point where you've done four questions and answer them of everything. Make sense? Would you say that's about right? You need to answer four things? Like, I'd like you to do four circuit problems, and then we know you know circuit somewhat. At least you've got, a, got some better knowledge than no circuit. Okay, we're going to, as I say, do the work energy theorem. Now, I don't know why I dread this section. It's such a nice, easy section, yet I dread it. There's certain sections I like and certain sections I don't like. Um, but that I shouldn't tell you because maybe my prejudice will rub off on you. Let's start with something nice though. Science on the news yesterday, nice to see science on the news. Anyone know, anyone watch the news? Big discovery in science. Black holes. Black holes. They photographed it for the first time. Did you see that photograph? You know what? It? it looks like my worst photograph. It looks like that. Black. And then it's got like a fuzzy smear around it. And it took them two years, millions of dollars to photograph that with various telescopes. They had to make dozens of telescopes in space. Focus them all on this black hole. This black hole was 53 million light years away. And we call it a super massive black hole because it is bigger than the solar system, our solar system. And so, it just, it's like a greedy so thing. So hang on, hang on. Right. It just gobbles up whatever comes close to it. It's got what is called the event horizon, if you've watched science fiction. You come close to it, it's like a whirlpool, and it sucks you in, and as you get sucked in, you go faster and faster. You burn up, you get stretched to like spaghetti, and time goes slower, so you're like caught in the super... To you, it feels like normal time. To someone who's standing there watching you die, or be stretched to spaghetti, it looks like you've stopped. Time stops for you at a black hole. Excuse me? And then some people say you can travel in time through a black hole. You've seen the science fiction movies. And Stephen Hawkins, you remember the genius, said that you can possibly travel backwards in time. Wouldn't that be exciting? You could go backwards. You could tell your mother, please don't have me. I hate this world. <laughs> You could, you could choose your own parents. You could maybe match make and say, mother, marry this person. Okay, well, there's all kinds of science fiction. To me, it's all garbage. You can't travel backwards in time. That's rubbish. So, Stephen Hawkins, you know nothing. Okay, Stephen Thomas, you know everything. Okay. <laughs> so, on your time, the energy level, will the physics behind it? Do you think it's impossible? They could go back in time. Yes. Do you think that's so, imagine you go back in time and you say, look at this. I've got this computer and I've got this calculator and look at the magical, fantastic things they can do. And then the guy will look at you and say, you've got a time machine, you came back in time. What are these things compared to a time machine? You get the joke. So you go back in time, you want to impress him with your cell phone. And the guy says, but there's a time machine, you came back in time. That's impressive. Okay, it's a bad joke. I mean, last time I tell a joke. Any other questions before we carry on? <laughs> um, there was one reason that I was telling that joke, and I just want to see if I can find the balloon. Here's a balloon, and 53 billion, a million light years away, that means it takes 53 million years for the light to get here, traveling at the speed of light, which is C. It's a long trip. But do you see these lines? That represents the wavelengths of light. 
Now, what do you think would happen if I blew up this balloon? Do so you think the wavelengths would squash or stretch? I don't, I hate blowing things up. If I can't do it, then I'm going to have to ask someone else to. Oh, it's got a hole in this universe. Whoa. Oh, there it's coming out. There. Do you see how the wavelength gets longer? Yes. Now, there's a reason I'm telling you this. And now the wavelength's getting back to normal. Let me tell you the reason. The universe was created by God 13.75 billion years ago. And light has been traveling outwards from what the scientists call the Big Bang. That's the... But the religious people call it, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Same thing. As the light has been traveling out, now listen to this first thing, maybe I'll answer your question. As light's been traveling out, something's been happening to the universe after the Big Bang. The universe has been expanding. How many of you know that? You know that. So I'm not lying, right? I'm not the one who makes it up. How many have heard that the universe is expanding? It's not just that the planets are getting further apart. It's what we call, what Einstein calls space-time. Length is getting longer, breadth is getting longer, height is getting longer, and time. All is being stretched like a balloon. As a result, the light that was created at the Big Bang, which was, there was some light there. The light has been stretched, so the wavelength goes from short to long. Ultraviolet is being stretched and becomes what? What, what is, if I stretch ultraviolet and make it a longer wavelength, what does it become? Violet becomes? Red, eventually. Becomes indigo, then blue, then green, then yellow, then orange, and finally if we stretch it enough, it becomes red. That is why light from far back in time is what we call red shifted. And this is where Doppler comes in. Where does Doppler come in? You can tell how fast or how far things are away from Earth or from the city, from Earth by how red shifted their light is. So if it's close, like the sun is yellow, but if you go further away from and time passes and billions of years pass, the, the light, the further away you go, the light becomes Doppler or red shifted. Remember, Doppler is the apparent change in frequency. So the universe has got a Doppler effect. The further back in time you look, the redder the light becomes. Interesting, isn't it? And when you look, and they actually have telescopes like Hubble that can look back 13.75 billion years, they actually can almost see the Big Bang. Almost. Now you say, how do they know it's that far back? Well, if you look through a telescope, you can see further. I can see Somerset West, maybe, with a telescope. If I get a bigger telescope, I can see further. And they get the bigger and bigger and bigger telescopes for eventually they can see right back to the origin of the universe. It's amazing cosmology. Sorry, you had a question, the letters? Uh, the letter. Okay, so how do they determine the age of the universe? It's like, how do they know that it is 53, partially from the redshift? Partially from the fact that there's certain stars, they are called, like candle stars, they always have the same brightness. So as they get further away, the same star type becomes dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. So they, they look for those stars as far back, and the dimmers, measured in lux, is how they know how far back it is. Also, as I say, the light becomes more and more redshifted, so that tells you also how far away it is. But listen to how it takes 53 million years for light to get from this black hole which they've been photographing to get here so the universe is ancient any other questions in the old days they believed the earth was like a table and you could fall off 
but the earth is round, so you can't drop off. So you can't go out of the earth. Like <laughs> you can't, if you walk around like they thought sailing ships would come to the edge of the earth and fall off but if you keep sailing around you just come to the other side where you started so that's what um, Columbus was trying to do when he discovered America he was trying to see if you could fall off the earth or if, if we could get back to where we started if the earth is circular amazing to think that people thought the earth was flat <laughs> If you can, if you're Elon Musk, you've got enough money and you can get up to a certain velocity, you will travel, you will break gravity. It's, there's a certain exact velocity you just have to reach. You reach that velocity, the pull of gravity is weaker than what is called your escape velocity, and you get out. I think it was Apollo 8. Sure. Who's your brother? Oh, okay. So you're traveling too slow for your rocket going up? If you're traveling too slowly, you won't make space and you'll fall back to Earth. Well, it will burn out, but it will burn out before you get enough speed to escape. And Apollo 8, I think, was the first spaceship carrying people to escape the velocity of Earth. Uh, I could be wrong, because didn't, the, didn't oh, the Russians got a Sputnik up first? Yeah, that was the first object that the Russians beat the Americans to put something in space. Sputnik. Any other questions before we carry on with this energy stuff? Okay. Energy. Yeah. So when, when you die, you go to the black hole. Excuse me? When you die, you go to the black hole. The reason they say you'll die is because not only does time go slower, but you get stretched. And it, it will disjoint you. It will turn you into a very long piece of human being. <laughs> and time will go slower by your feet than by your head. So you're going to be disjointed. The time is going to be a different time by your head, by your feet, but eventually when you stretch. Do scientists believe in God? I totally believe in God. Why? And I'm saying there's some phony preachers out there who say the earth is 6,000 years old. They must read their science books a little better. Because nowhere does the Bible even say the earth, you find me the chapter and verse which says the earth is 6,000 years old. It just says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It doesn't say where. And it's also obvious that, the di that there's, do you know that there's 99% more fossil animals buried in the earth than there are animals present today? Do you think those 99 times more animals, including dinosaurs, tyrannosaurs, do you think everything lived on earth at the same time? Of course not. You go to those layers, those fossil layers, you get the Cambrian where life started. Um, then, well, you get the Cambrian, then you get the various layers. Then you get the Ordovician and the Silurian and the Devonian and so on, and the Carboniferous. You get all those layers, and every layer of fossils has got its own ecosystem. So if you study biology, you know, you've got your predators, your, your tertiary consumers, then you've got your secondary consumers, your primary consumers, then you've got your herbivores, which are your guys who, who eat the plants, and then you've got your autotrophs. But each ecosystem has its set of creatures. You can't mix dinosaurs with humans. Do you know how long Adam would have survived if dinosaurs would, were on Earth? <laughs> like, you watch Jurassic Park. Now, give Adam a fig leaf or a something and stick him out there with the dinosaurs and, and, and then watch the movie Jurassic Park to see how long he would survive. He wouldn't survive long enough to produce offspring. So humans, there's no trace of human fossils with dinosaur fossils. So it's just that, that's just that definite. And, I, and the day they find dinosaur and human fossils, oh boy, that's going to be an interesting day. Mixed together. They haven't. There's phony people who say they found a footprint of a dinosaur, of a human in a, in a dinosaur. I don't believe it. Um, Questions? I'm sorry, is it true cool that um, dinosaurs are ancestors of chicken? <laughs> um, I got it from the public on the TV, so. Okay, well, let's put it this way. Dinosaurs and chickens got a lot in common. They've got a, you look at a dinosaur, doesn't that look like it's got tiny little chicken wing arms? T-Rex? It's got hollow bones, it's, some of them have got very similar. But, but think about this question. If God made everything at different times, 
not at all at the same time. There's been every geological age is God's creating a different thing. Finally, 6,000 years ago, he makes man. So the reason dinosaurs look like chickens is because they have the same creator who thought that's a great shape. We can have big things that look like chickens. We can have, call them dinosaurs. We can have small things that look like chickens. And we can call them birds. So, so is it the same that, um, is it the same philos philosophy or belief that um, humans, they evolved from being apes? You see, I don't believe in evolution. I believe in creation. <laughs> so, so don't, I didn't hear, what was your comment? What was that? So I'm not saying I believe in evolution. I'm saying I believe in creation, but multiple creation. So, honestly, do you think evolution is a water? You know, 40-something years ago when I was at Wits doing botany and zoology, dissecting every single animal and plant there was, went to all the lectures and they all talked evolution, evolution, evolution. I sat there thinking, this is the biggest load of nonsense. Because a simpler explanation is if you've got the same maker making the same thing, there's going to be similarity. Now you see, I didn't know at the time the greatest proof against evolution. And I'll give it to you. 500 million years ago, there's this thing called the Cambrian explosion. We have the Precambrian, where there's no life. Then suddenly on Earth appears the Cambrian explosion where you get lots of life. Now in China, about a month ago, there was a news item. They discovered more Cambrian fossils. You know what the Cambrian explosion was? Do you guys do life science? Yes. You know you've got all your phyla, king phyla. You've got your platyelminthes, your anelida, you've got your vertebrates, your invertebrates, you've got your mollusca, you've got your anelida, which is, you've got the whole tooth that I taught life science for 20 years. Do you know that most of those phyla popped out of nowhere so here's mud, 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 mud for since the creator, since the earth was formed. Mud, mud, mud. I look at my mountains there by Simonstown. I go look for fossils. No fossils, just sandstone. Mud, 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 mud. Suddenly, all the fire, virtually, of animals appear in a blink. Suddenly, all the fire are there, including vertebrates. At the same time, at the very first ancient layer called the Cambrian. I didn't know that. I never studied. Um, I never studied paleontology or archaeology. But now, doesn't that sound like the opposite of evolution? I have been taught that evolution starts with the amoeba, then it evolved into the hydra, then the hydra, which is two layers, evolved evolved into the platyelminthes, which is the that flat thing. So, and it usually takes a long period of time. And it takes a long period. And then it developed the coelom, a cavity. That was the anelida. And then the anelida, the worms, started to develop legs and things. Okay. No, that all happened right from the start. It was all there. To me, that's the biggest proof that it was all created at one time. I never heard that till I got onto a religious forum about three years ago. And they had a whole lot of religious people and scientists, atheists, talking about the creation and the evidence. And suddenly I started getting interested in paleontology. And suddenly when I saw this Cambrian explosion, I thought, wow, are you kidding me? This, all the fire just came at the same time. There's no gap between them. That doesn't sound like evolution. And it doesn't sound like, you know, the order that we've just been through. Now let's take another example. You remember the day the dinosaurs died? <laughs> they were they, a few days ago. They discovered a place where the dinosaurs died out. It's very, you know, where Florida is, you've got that Gulf of Mexico. You got where the old people go in Florida to go and retire. You know, Florida, the United States. 65 million years ago, a big asteroid hit there it was 12 miles wide it knocked all the dinosaurs and everything that were there living and it dumped them in a place they just found recently dinosaurs everything that was living there but it was so hot the trees were burnt the dinosaurs were burnt and the poor fish 
were, and they ate in like this, like, what can I call it? Um, dusty. And the heat sent up these little balls, like little beads, they're called tectites. And the poor fish were sticking their heads out of the water trying to breathe because the water was so murky. And this is at the same time that, that the dinosaurs and everything got buried by this tidal wave. And the fish breathed in these little falling balls from the meteor. And everything got buried together 65 um, million years ago. And after that, there wasn't a single dinosaur left apart from crocodiles and snakes and birds and so on. But all the main dinosaur groups died out. And they found the exact spot where this meteor hit and where the main group were buried. But then this cloud spread to all the earth like a nuclear winter and it destroyed even the dinosaurs on the opposite side of the earth to Florida. It's all proven. And then it left, this, this meteor had a layer, it had iridium. It's a very rare element. And it covered the whole earth with this thin layer of iridium. It's on the, it's on the periodic table here. And we know that where that layer, I don't know what the symbol is for iridium, but it's one of those. Where, where the dinosaurs died out, there's this layer of iridium that covers the earth everywhere. The whole earth has got this thin little layer, and then above that, suddenly, the age of the mammals. No more dinosaurs. Not the mammals we see today, the big mammals. Giant things, giant sloths. Not even saber-toothed tigers, they were mammals that you wouldn't recognize. They were like just big ugly beasts. That's all I can say. And you can get the pictures of them. I can show you the pictures in books. They've got fossils. So that's why 99% of all animals who've ever lived, you could only find them in books of fossils. Any questions? So science is interesting. But let's try and do some work. Let's just see if I can get a little bit of work done. Okay. Um, okay. This here is the work energy theorem. It's got this formula, work F is equal to delta K. What is delta K? Change in kinetic energy. Okay, let's do work. And it's, all the problems are like this. You've got a little ball. It's got no kinetic energy. It rolls to the bottom. It's got kinetic energy. And it rolls up the other side, where does it stop is the question. Now, if, if there's no friction, take a guess how high it will roll up the other side. You can't see it because it's got friction. I'll give you another hint. Where's my keys? In the door. Okay, here's something with less friction. Just imagine it's a ball rolling. Now watch how high it gets to. You see how high it gets on the other side? It gets virtually the same height. So there's, there's the principle. If there's no friction, a ball that rolls down a slope will roll to the same height up the next slope. It'll take no extra energy to get it to the same height. Does it make sense? Make sense to everybody? Now, do you think if there's no friction, it matters what the shape of the slope is? So you repeat that if there's no friction, the ball and... Okay. If in the section, we roll balls down slopes. Okay, maybe you want to take this down, because I want to give you a notebook. Okay, in this section we roll balls down slope. So okay. And hey, just to finish it off, we could, well let's finish it off next time. If the ball 